started um, working. So um, I thought I'd start today by sharing a story, an experience I had about 20 years ago. So um, we had just graduated from college and we'd moved to the Seattle area where my husband had gotten a job up there and I had just had my first baby. And I decided that I was going to be home with my uh, kids, but I, I needed something more. Uh, I was a little worried that I could just uh, be home with my kids. I, I wanted to make sure I was still doing some more things. So I put together a resume. I sent it to my county and I said, if you have any boards or positions like that, that you're looking for volunteers, um, I hope you'll consider me. Well, a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from our Republican County Commissioner and they asked if I'd be willing to serve on the Human Rights Council. And I didn't know much about what that council was. She said it was just an advisory board and, and you know, she just thought we needed some different um, new people on it. And that was one of her uh, part, you know, boards she needed to make uh, assignments to. So she wondered if I would serve there. So I said, sure, not knowing much about it. Um, I first realized this was maybe a bigger deal than I thought when I opened the newspaper the next week and saw an article about myself being appointed to that board and all sorts of information about me uh, in the newspaper. And I realized maybe this board was a little bit bigger deal than I had thought. So I show up to my first meeting and here I am. I think I'm, I think I probably turned 22, but I wasn't very old yet. I just out of school, um, you know, just a, a feeling like a little stay at home mom uh, and other people on the council were um, a gentleman who used to work for the UN and um, a woman who was the teachers union president for Washington state. There was a pastor from a really large church in the area. There was a tribal elder. Um, there was an executive from Lockheed Martin and I felt 100% intimidated and completely out of place. And the board was very welcoming. Um, to their credit, everyone was very welcoming and happy to have me there. Um, and as, as time went on, I learned pretty quickly that my viewpoints and perspectives were maybe a little different than um, a majority of that council. So I served there about a year when an incredibly controversial issue came before that council. And we were supposed to give um, some policy direction to the commissioners. And I felt sick about it because I knew that my thoughts about this issue were different than everybody else's. And I still felt very intimidated on this council. And so I, I just thought about this agenda item all week leading up to the meeting. Just, and I just was literally making myself sick thinking, what am I gonna do about this? Because I know that where I'm coming from is different and my thoughts, uh, our thoughts probably not everybody on the council would agree with. And so finally on the day of the meeting, when I was going to head up there, I decided, you know what, I'll go to the meeting. And I don't have to say anything. They're going to do what they're going to do. And I'll just go and I, I just probably won't talk, you know, but I'll, I'll go to the meeting. So I show up at the meeting and this council, because the county was so large, we would move around and hold our meetings in different locations every time. So this meeting happened to be at a really obscure kind of county building up at a city park about 30 minutes from my house. So I get up to the meeting, it starts, I'm still just sitting there feeling uncomfortable and um, get to the agenda item. And right then my neighbor walks in and I was totally taken aback at seeing my neighbor at this meeting. And he looked around and I could tell he was kind of like, a, he looked a little confused. And the chair of the council uh, stopped the meeting and, and said to him, um, hi, you know, this is the Human Rights Council, and is this where you mean to be? And, and he said, no, no, I'm trying to find this other meeting. And he was in completely the wrong place in the county. You know, he was totally in the wrong spot. And, and so they gave him directions on where he was supposed to be. And he, when he turned around to leave, he saw me. And he stopped and he goes, well, what are you doing here? And I sat there thinking, what am I doing here? I have no idea what I'm doing here. Um, and I thought, that's a really great question. <laughs> and, and then I had the thought, and this thought is the thought that has always stuck with me is, I don't really know what I'm doing here, but I do know this. If I'm here and I'm sitting in this chair, there's no point in me being here if I don't say anything, if I don't speak up, if I don't share the perspective, I was asked to come here and sit in this seat and give. And um, so that day, as we talked about the agenda item, I brought up my concerns. 
I brought up the things that I knew that not everybody maybe agreed with, but that but some people did had that perspective. And um, it, we ended up, you know, substantially changing the proposal. And so that has always stuck with me. And I have thought about that question. What are you doing here? Over and over again in my life, what am I doing here? I think about it in regards to my personal life. I think about it in regards to my professional life. What am I doing here? And, and um, even today, you know, what am I doing here giving this lecture? There was lots of people they could ask. So what am I doing here? What can I do to contribute? So I have just a couple of slides I'm gonna share as we go. So I'm gonna share my screen because I want to show. Okay, you should be seeing my screen. Thumbs up. Okay, perfect. Um, there is a quote from Cheryl Sandberg that I wanted to share. Um, the most common metaphor for careers is a ladder, but this concept no longer applies to most workers. Uh, careers are a jungle gym, not a ladder. Ladders are limiting. People can only move up or down, on or off. Jungle gyms have more creative exploration. There's only one way to get to the top of a ladder, but there are many ways to get to the top of a jungle gym. And I have thought about that quote a lot for the years because I like that metaphor. And I have seen that that's how my professional career has played out. And I've seen that in the lives of so many women, that there are um, multiple ways um, that women can approach their professional careers. And not just women, everyone really, especially I think as a new generation of workers approaches work, that they're going to have a number of different jobs. They're not going to stay with the same corporation their whole career. And so how, how do we um, think about um, this and value the choices that everyone's made? I hope we can continue to get to a place where we um, value all of the choices, especially that women uh, choose to make, whether that means they pause their employment to take care of their kids or an aging parent, or if they are uh, driven and they're just driving straight to the boardroom. That's great too. All of those choices are valid and all of those choices are important. And I hope we can continue to uh, value all of those choices that women might make. So I thought I'd share a little bit about my journey to end up in the legislature and um, how SEU played a role in that. So Karen, it looks like you might be frozen. The traditional. Sorry, just one. Sorry, Karen, just one second. All right, I think I lost you for a minute. Is everybody back? Yeah, we're back. Okay, we have you. All of a sudden, everything was gone. Okay. So, um, so I think I was saying that I took a 10 year gap and um, was with my kids for 10 years, and I've never regretted that choice. So, over those years, I did have a couple of um, opportunities to do kind of part time things. Um, I picked up a few contracts or things like that. I also ran for the city council during those 10 years and won that seat. And I volunteered at my kids' schools, I volunteered in the state PTA, but by and large, I was home with my kids. And so when my baby went to kindergarten, I decided I wanted to, to re-enter the um, traditional workplace, but it felt a little insurmountable because of that gap. And so um, I started looking into graduate degrees and that's when I found SUU's MPA program. And I liked the flexibility of it. I liked it being online. I liked that it was affordable compared to lots of other programs. It was just a great fit for me. Um, and so when I went to apply, as you all know, because you've done this, you need some letters of recommendation. And so I had asked Tammy Piper, who at the time was the governor's education advisor, to write one of my letters of recommendation. I met Tammy when I was volunteering for uh, the state PTA and doing some just contract work for the state board of education. And uh, we'd become friends. And so I reached out to her and asked if she'd write one of my letters of recommendation. And she did. And then a few months later, she called me and asked if um, this graduate degree required an internship because she really wanted me to come service her intern. Well, I got the internship requirement waived, but I still needed a professional project then. 
And so I said, well, I'm not working right now. I would love to help do a professional project for your office. And so we got it all worked out and I went to work in the governor's office. So this was in 2015 and um, it was a great experience, right? So I, I worked with her during the legislative session. I helped her manage um, all the bills that impact education. Um, the education advisor deals with both public education, but higher education. So there's usually about 200 pieces of legislation that impact education every year. So it's a lot for one person to manage alone. Um, so I, I did that and it was um, an incredible experience. I finished up when the session ended, so in March. And as the months went on after I left the governor's office, they would continue to call me. They would call and they would ask me questions about um, different things. They would ask if I could assist with different projects. Um, and they asked sometimes political strategies. What do you think, how we should handle this issue? And about in August, I, I received one of those calls and, and I said on the phone, I really appreciated my time in the governor's office and I really appreciate our relationship, but I haven't worked for you for five months. And the things you're asking me to do are things that you would ask an employee to do. And I don't work for you. And um, when I hung up the phone, I remember exactly where I was sitting uh, when I hung up the phone and I thought, oh my gosh, I hope I did not burn that bridge. Um, but I also felt like I wasn't being valued. and. The very next day, I got a phone call from the governor's office and they extended a job, an offer of employment for me to serve as the governor's deputy education advisor. And um, so I have always been grateful. I was a little bold in that moment and and spoke up for myself, um, too. So I um, I said yes to that, which was a little hard to do because I still had one year left of my MPA. I'd gotten a scholarship from Hill Air Force Base um, that was gonna cover my last year, as long as I went full time. I was still in the city council. Uh, I have three kids and um, I went to work for the governor. And so for a year I had all those things going and I think my eye twitched the entire time. <laughs> I wasn't really sleeping, but um, it just felt like such an opportunity um, to do all of those things that I, didn't, I couldn't say no to any of them, but um, I was really grateful. I was really grateful for that. and. And um, just like we talked about this being a jungle gym, it, it was a, a pivot, you know, it was it was a different way um, to head where I thought I was gonna go. So I worked in that role for five years. Um, when Tammy Pfeiffer left the office, I finished up as Governor Herbert's education advisor. Um, and this was, uh, I served during the time of the pandemic. So I um, spent a long time, many long, long hours trying my darndest to keep schools and colleges and higher education institutions open try and keep teachers from walking out of the classroom and trying to keep everyone um, as safe and healthy as we could. So it was a, a really challenging but um, important, I felt like political, I mean, um, professional experience. So um, the thing about working for governors is they don't stay governor forever. And when they go, then, um, then so does your job. <laughs> so Governor Herbert um, finished up his term and uh, Governor Cox won election to be the governor. And he invited only three of us that were working for Governor Herbert to stay on and work for him. But he offered me a different position. So he asked if I would serve as a legislative affairs director, which was a new position. Um, governor Herbert had relied previously on his general counsel to do legislative affairs for him, but Governor Cox wanted to divide those roles. And so uh, I jumped in, I had to uh, create the job from the ground up and decide what it looked like, how it would be most helpful for him and how I could best support him. So uh, in that job, my responsibilities were to create relationships with legislators, to give him counsel on which bills to sign and which ones to veto, uh, just even managing the, the actual physical copies of the bills as they came through our office and got um, we took action upon them. And then I would negotiate with the legislature on behalf of the governor. So another twist and turn um, up the jungle gym so I had this position about a year and then I got another call um, that <laughs> sent my life uh, in a new direction once again. So my house representative called me and he told me that in, um, he called me about a year ago. So in December of last year, he called me and said, um, I am going to be resigning from the legislature tomorrow. I took a, a new job with the state and I can't also be in the legislature. Um, and I think you should put your name in. They're gonna hold a special election. And, and you have to 
do it tomorrow. <laughs> and so um, it was a long night of uh, talking to my husband. Uh, I called Governor Cox and we had a conversation um, and just thinking about, okay, do we want to upend everything and, and do this? But it also felt like such a unique opportunity that might never come again. So in the morning, I decided I was going to file and I announced that I was going to run for the legislature. Um, it was a two week special election. So from the day we filed till the day they held the election was only two weeks. So I worked my tail off for two weeks, uh, meeting with delegates and talking to folks and, and doing what I could. Um, five people filed, including um, two mayors. So um, it, it wasn't uh, a walk in the park. Um, there were some very qualified and good candidates also running. And um, on the Saturday before Christmas last year, I was elected to the house. So then I had to quit my job uh, with the governor. So um, I, felt, I felt bad because it was right before the session. And obviously that was my job with the governor. Um, but he was incredibly um, supportive of me personally, even though that put their office in kind of a difficult position and, and they were scrambling a little bit. But um, I've always appreciated that both Governor Cox and Governor Herbert have always um, supported me both personally and professionally as um, I've made choices. So 10 days before the session last year, I was sworn in uh, as a member of the House of Representatives to represent my district. And then because um, it was a midterm appointment, I had to run for election uh, in this, this year. So pretty much um, I filed right when I <laughs> was appointed. And then in November, I was elected. So now I'm beginning my uh, new two-year term uh, starting now. We'll start, we'll start the session on Tuesday. So when some of the questions um, I get asked are, what's it like being in the legislature? And I will tell you, if anyone tells you they like it all the time, they're lying. <laughs> it's great a lot of the time, but it's not great all the time. Um, it's also totally exhausting, and, but it's also exhilarating. So in Utah, the legislative session is only 45 days. It's one of the shortest legislative sessions in the country. Uh, and having a very short legislative session is, um, provides us some unique opportunities, but it also presents a few challenges. So this means, first of all, that being in the legislature is not my full-time job. Uh, it couldn't be, it pays terrible. And outside of the 45 days, um, you know, you're only, you're doing two days a month, maybe, um, and some months we don't meet at all. So um, you definitely need another job. So having a legislature made up of people with other jobs means that you get a legislature that's filled with a variety of expertises and professionals. So if a bill comes up about insurance, there was a bill last year about branding cattle. I don't know anything about branding cattle, but somebody in the body did, right? <laughs> because that's their profession. Um, bills about energy, bills about insurance, um, bills about technology. There's, there's somebody in our body that kind of has working knowledge of that area. And that's a real, um, it's a real benefit to the body because you want legislation that's actually practicable um, and can be implemented. Uh, implemented. So that's, that's a good thing. It also means we have to live with the laws that we pass and they impact our personal lives and our businesses. Uh, so I think that's also a value um, for Utahns. I think it's good that we have a part, very part-time legislature. Um, it also means that legislators have to have employers who are supportive of their service. So after I left the governor's office, I was offered a job at Sunrise Engineering and they're in the community development manager. So we do land use planning and zoning, um, you know, general plans. We work with cities and counties um, on those types of uh, land use planning issues and, and projects. And my um, company has been very good to provide me the flexibility I need so I can serve in the legislature. Most of my colleagues have to take unpaid leaves of absence um, from their jobs. And that could be a financial hardship on people trying to serve in the legislature. So that's one of the challenges. Another challenge is in 45 days, there is a lot to do. So um, typically the le legislators request about 1200 bill files every session. Um, by the time they get drafted and numbered, that usually whittles down to maybe seven to 800, and then about five of them will end up passing. So that means we start thinking about how many hours are in the day and 500 different bills, that 
you have to get through a lot of bills in a really short period of time. And also, our state does a budget every year. Some states go every other year, but our state um, passes budget every year. So we also have to decide how we're going to spend $25 million, which is also um, a lot of money and a lot of negotiation. So practically, this means that during the session, my days usually start, my first meeting is usually around 7 a.m. And it's not unusual to have meetings um, up until 9 or 10 at night. Um, and the last week of the session, I usually end up just staying in Salt Lake all week because we're there so early in the morning and then we're there so late at night that I don't even have time to drive home and back. You know, I just crash in a hotel um, by the Capitol because it's, it's just you're there all the time. So despite the exhaustion, there are definitely, um, there's definitely an element of adrenaline <laughs> related to being in the legislature. And I have to say, I love um, when we build coalitions. I love coming up with solutions to problems, um, navigating a bill through the process. And then when it all comes together and you see a bill that you worked on pass, that is a really great feeling. Um, so both now in the legislature and when I was working in the governor's office, I've had the opportunity to work on legislation that now I have seen um, impact the lives of Utahns in a positive way. And I'm just really grateful that I've been given the opportunity to have a, 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 play, a part to play in some of that happening. So um, how do you come up with ideas of what bills to run? People ask me that often as well too. So I would say um, some bills come to me, people will reach out and they'll say, um, hey, I, you know, we need you to solve this problem or this, this issue with the, there's an issue here in the code and this is what it's doing. So sometimes they come to you that way. Sometimes you have an idea on your own. You just see, see things and you think, gosh, I'm gonna fix that. And then sometimes they're kind of in response to um, audits or situations that arise that then you um, run a bill on. So this session starts next week. I have bills on higher education governance, alcohol policy, urban farming, local health district governance, uh, a student supplemental grant bill, and some student mental health bills, um, a proper, and a property tax process bill. So very, very different um, bills. Sometimes too, they bill, uh, your bill files come out of the committees that you serve on. For example, I have a bill that's going to repeal a, a motor vehicle committee. I'm, I'm the vice chair of transportation, and this was a bill that was brought to me by DPS, a, a committee that doesn't meet anymore. So they just want to repeal that out of the code. So they came to me because I was on that committee. Uh, so that's kind of how, how bills come to you. So if you are ever interested in being in the legislature at some point, what should you do now to prepare? For that. So I would say first, if you need an internship, be a legislative intern. Um, every legislator is assigned an intern that is our staff. That's all we have. We don't have professional staff in the legislature other than uh, you know a few people assigned to a whole bunch of people. We have professional attorneys and that, but really like um, our personal staff is our intern during the session. So I was an intern 20 years ago um, when I was doing my undergrad and it was a great experience. I was um, super um, happy that I was able to do that because I learned a lot because it's not even just you're getting a front row seat, like you're in the middle of all of the action because you're making sure the meetings happen and you're in the room when everything's getting negotiated because you become the staff. And it's, it's essential support for legislators like you are needed. Um, so, if that's something you can think about if you've ever done an internship there. Also consider serving in local government. So my experiences on the city council make me a better legislator. They have helped me know my community better and they also give me a working understanding of the role of local government. So the legislature does not need to be all things to all people. And I strongly believe in local government and local control and letting communities respond um, to their own needs in a way that doesn't um, have the legislature dictating kind of one size fits all approaches. If you're from Blanding or if you're from Bountiful, those are very different communities and you should be able to deal with the issues that you have in a way that makes sense for your community. So I think that experience and understanding what local governments can do um, helps make me a better legislator because I don't feel the need to step in to all those spaces. Um, also to be in the legislature, you have to run in an election. So get involved in a campaign. Learn how the caucus system works if you're in Utah. Um, learn how candidates can gather signatures. Um, you should run and be a county or state delegate for the political party that you belong to. Um, there's also inexpensive um, trainings from nonpartisan groups like Utah Women Run, and I attended some of those over the years. 
And if you're gonna run in a state legislative race, if you're running in a house race, I would say you need to raise $20,000. So that's probably maybe more, maybe less, depending on how many people are running. So understanding how to raise money and how to manage that money legally so you don't get into trouble um, is also really important. So volunteering on campaigns and helping out um, or going to trainings is really good for that type of thing. Also, um, the Lieutenant Governor's website has a lot of good candidate resources for you, like things like when would you file and how do you keep track of your finances? So what are the rules regarding that? So those are some things I think. And I would say at the very least, just get out into your community, volunteer, serve on boards, participate with your political party, um, do things like help with your town days. I mean, it doesn't have to be some big political policy thing, but just getting out into your community um, will help you uh, learn about what issues are important to the people in your area. And um, because if you want to one day represent them, you're going to want to know um, what the people in your community and area think about different things. Okay, I'm trying to my screen again. We'll see if I if I lose everyone. But I have a couple of just a couple of lessons learned. I think I'd like to share here at the end. So let's try this again. Okay. Okay. Let's go. First lesson learned. Um, sometimes they aren't ready for you. That's gonna be my first lesson learned. So when I first ran for the city council, I was um, 20 years younger than everybody else. And um, I had lived in my city 20 years less than everybody else that was on the council. But that was one of the reasons I ran. I felt really strongly that um, our community was a growing community and a young community. And people weren't thinking about safe routes to schools because they didn't have kids in school anymore. Um, and so there were reasons I felt like I wanted to be part of that. I'm also, as you maybe have um, ascertained from this uh, <laughs> lecture so far, I'm, I'm pretty much an all-in person. If I'm gonna do something, I'm, I'm kind of all in. I like to delve into the weeds. I like to look at the issues. I like to compare and, and learn about things. And the council at the time when I was elected was they're all wonderful people, but they were kind of on cruise control. And so when I showed up, I, I asked a lot of questions. And one of the first things I did when I was elected is I went around and I met with all of the um, department heads. I wanted to know what issues were important to them, how things were going in their departments, those kinds of things. Um, and I met with the fire chief and <laughs> I remember this very well, you know, as we talked through everything, he said, I just want to say one more thing to you before, you know, at the end of the meeting, one more thing. And he said, there are some people in our city who are not ready for you yet. And sometimes you're going to get frustrated. He said, but just remember, there's a lot of us who are, and we're glad you're here. And I so appreciated that because there were a number of times when I felt like I was just running into resistance and, um, and, and I learned a lot about how to still be effective when maybe they're not ready for you yet. I had the city manager at one point tell me we were, um, I was in his office and we were discussing a policy related to how the city would use one-time funding. And I had brought an example of a model policy I thought the city could adopt. And the city manager said to me, well, he was in his seventies. He said, that's how someone from your generation would do that. But right now I'm in charge and my generation does it differently. <laughs> it took all of me to not say, yeah, but you're leaving. So you might as well <laughs> adopt our way because you're on your way out. We're on our way in. Anyways, um, sometimes they're just not quite ready for you yet. Um, I, I had friends um, also, I mean, this also applies in the legislature, right? So when I was an intern, women were not allowed to wear pants on the Senate floor. You had to always be in a dress or skirt or they would not allow you on the Senate floor. Um, that has changed. You can wear pants on the, on the Senate floor. But sometimes they just don't think about things from a different perspective because there haven't been a lot of women there. There still have not been a lot of women there, especially a lot of Republican women. Um, and just this week, I had an example. I went um, to check my mailbox in the house and they had gotten a gift for every member of the house. And so they were all in our, our boxes and I was like, oh, that's so nice. Well, I opened my gift, the same gift everyone got, which is a pair of cufflinks. And I don't know if you know much about women's fashion, but 
I don't have a lot of views for couplings, but when, you know, when they decided a gift for everyone, that's the gift we all got. So I gifted them to somebody that just got appointed that didn't get them and is a male now member of the house. So I re-gifted mine to him, but, but some, so sometimes these things still happen. People just don't think, I don't know how many times I've been asked who's watching your children. I don't know that my husband's ever been asked who's watching his children, but I still get asked that, you know, and at this point I, you know, my kids are getting older, but those years in the city council, I got to say, my husband, he's great. They have a dad. He's watching, he's watching the children, not even babysitting. He's their parent, you know? So, so I would just want to say this. It doesn't help though, if you're in the situation to become a bomb thrower, instead take a step back, think about what, the, where these people are coming from that might be different than you or thinking different than you and figure out places where you push, where you nudge, where you get things uh, moved along. But if you just come in and throw bombs then it's not particularly helpful. So here's my next thing. Take your seat at the table. So this is um, when I was in the governor's office. I'm there at the end. And when I first started, um, I think you can see there's some chairs around the edge of the table. I would always sit in a chair, not at the table. And um, even sometimes they would say, Karen, there's a seat here at the table. And I would always defer to other people. Because if you look around this room, there's some incredibly smart and wonderful people sitting around the table. And I just felt like, oh, they should be at the table, right? Not me, not me, I can sit behind. Well, the problem with sitting behind is when issues come up, it's hard to speak up from the back of the room. It's hard to speak up when you're not the one at the table. So especially if you're offered a seat at the table, you take the seat at the table. Um, and then also know that, you know, everyone around that table right there has wonderful experience and expertise, but they don't have the same experience and expertise as me. And so it's okay to value and know that you bring something of value when you sit at the table. And then the other part is once you're at the table, look around. Look around and say, who's not here? Whose voice is missing? Um, because you get the best policies when everyone has a seat at the table. So don't be afraid to scooch over. Um, I see this a lot with women in politics is that they don't want to help anyone else out because it's just hard to get where they got. And so they're not really interested in helping women come behind them. And I think that's incredibly unfortunate. I think that's a scarcity mentality we don't need to have because um, lots of voices is a good thing. It's a good thing for our state. It's a good thing for problem solving. It's a good thing for policy outcomes that impact everyone in a positive way. Um, I don't know if um, Roger Carter's made you read Crucial Conversations yet, but you know that idea of the pool of meaning and, and everybody having the opportunity to put things into the pool so you get um, better solutions. Next, um, let's see. Whoop, here's my pictures, let's see, we got mixed up. Um, you can't do everything. Saying yes means um, saying no. And I've had to learn that and that's hard for me, but you can't do everything well. And when I say yes to everything, that means I am saying no to things like being with my family. It also means I'm saying no to maybe not doing things as well as I would like to do them because I'm spread too thin. So think about how you wanna spend your time and prioritize that time and be intentional. So in working with governors, we often would talk about, is this a legacy item? Is this something that you want to be remembered for uh, when you serve as governor? And if the governor says, I want 20, 20 legacy items. These 20 things are important to me. Then guess what? You'll have no legacy items. But if you pick three things and you say, these are the three things we're gonna make sure we focus on, we're gonna make a difference on, and they're gonna be the things that we um, can be our legacy items and be remembered for, you'll be a lot more successful. So think about Governor Huntsman, and I think he left a legacy in income tax changes and the way he cut income tax and moved this to a flat tax, or Olene Walker, and, and how she valued K-3 reading and how that became so important to her. She left a legacy because she focused on what she thought was the most important. So think about that in your own lives. Um, find your people. So um, on the city council, I used to joke that I did well because I could count to three, which is it takes three people to get something done. So if I didn't have two other friends, I would be banging my head against the wall um, if I couldn't get two other people to agree with me, right? So um, figure out how to find the other people who are interested in the same kind of issues you are, who maybe um, also want to solve the same kind of problems you do 
and find those people. Um, and then also, um, I would say, so this is my longtime book club. That's why I thought I'd throw this picture in. So we all met actually working at the Capitol, but now hardly any of us are there. And they are such a good reality check to me. One of the people in this picture actually is getting their MPA uh, from SCU right now. So that's kind of fun. Um, but they are just really good reality check to me because sometimes you get hyper focused on political issues or political things that are going on and you think it's just the end of the world if something doesn't happen a certain way. And it's good to have people who can be a reality check for you. Political memories are a lot shorter than we think that they are and things that we think are so important today, no one's even going to be talking about in six months. So find the people that can be that for you, that are just there for you, that help you um, help you keep perspective. And you know, I've also had the opportunity to work with the legislature now since I was an intern, so about 20 years in different capacities. And I've seen literally hundreds of legislators come and go. And it's good for me because that gives me perspective to realize I'm just taking my turn. And at some point, someone else is going to take their turn. And it's not about me, Karen Peterson, being so awesome or special. And that's why I'm getting invited to all of these events. It's because I'm holding a title right now. And they're inviting the title. And at some point, someone else will hold the title. And that's good. That's how it's supposed to work. And so uh, it's good to just keep that perspective, though, that it's not about you. But it's just about you're taking your turn and doing what you can. And then I'm going to end here with where I began. Keep asking, what am I doing here? So um, four years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer and it was stage three and it was terrifying and it was um, completely shocking and came out of the blue. And um, from the day I thought something was wrong until the day I started chemo was two weeks. So there wasn't a lot of time to process what was going on or what was happening. So I spent a year doing chemo and radiation, having surgeries, and feeling like crap. Um, but eventually, you know, I came through it. And um, and now it's been a couple of years, and so that's good. The farther I can get away from it, the um, less chances of recurrence. But having that experience changed me because it made me um, realize, again, something we all know, but we don't think about enough, which is that we only get so much time and we have to take advantage of the time we get. So I don't want, everyone to have to have cancer to learn that. You can learn that <laughs> without having cancer. Um, and, but it really has impacted everything that I do at this point, because I want to make sure that I make the time I get count. It's got to count. And life can put us in unexpected places, but that's okay. And we figure out what we're doing there, even though we didn't end up uh, plan on getting to that spot. And, um, and that's good too. So these are the questions I always ask myself. Am I making it better for my family, for my community, for my state? And if not, then what am I doing here? So thank you so much for having me today. And um, I think they said we're gonna do questions. I don't know if anyone will have any, but um, thanks so much for the invitation and the opportunity to talk about um, my experiences. Karen, thank you so much for sharing. That was a wonderful to be able to hear everything that you've uh, gone through. And, uh, I, as I was taking notes, it's just great to be able to read um, through those uh, you know, four steps on things that we can do to continue to move forward. So I love that. Uh, Claire, I'm going to turn the time over to you. If you want to look and see uh, what questions are coming in or students, if you're uh, not using the chat, feel free to also um, just jump in and, and ask any questions that you may have towards uh, for, for Karen. Yes, yeah, so like Joel said, if you guys have questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. Um, and then I'll monitor the chat. We did have one just come in from Derek. He asked, how do you keep a long-term perspective as you create legislation? That's a good question. So part of it is, I think you talk to people who have been in the industry that would be impacted um, for a long time, right? You want to make sure that what you're really doing is um, changing systems and not just speaking small things. Um, so let me give you an example. Maybe um, we passed some legislation related to um, school counselors a number of years ago. And we were really like kind of honed in and focused on um, elementary school counselors. And we, uh, we ran that program for a couple of years and we learned a lot. And so then we decided we really need to expand this. So sometimes 
what, if you want to make a good long-term impact, you take a couple of sh little shots at it, like shorter term things that will help you learn what you need to know so you can put something in place that works for the long haul. And then, so we came back and then we passed a much more expansive school counseling bill that impacted all the grades, um, but from the things that we learned from that short-term experience. So I think um, if you wanna make a long-term impact, you really wanna set your, your foundation up well. Um, and, and it takes some time trying a few things and, and setting that up statutorily. So you can set it up as a pilot program or set it up as something that sunsets. So you can, and then setting it up with certain metrics or, or um, elements that you want to track to make sure you're making a difference and then you know pass something maybe more um, more broadly. I'm working on this session of bill related to uh, teacher evaluations and that's our plan is we know we need to make changes in teacher evaluation but there's still a lot of questions about how that should play out and so we're going to we're going to give some um, school districts the opportunity to exempt themselves out of a few state statutes and try some things uh, in exchange for giving us information and data back so we can maybe make those changes for the state. Uh, well, students are shouting, I've got a, a question real fast. You know, you have, your first point was sometimes they're not ready for you. How do you help individuals get ready for you? Um, or or accept or accept that some people may never be ready for you? Yeah, so when I um, when I was on my second term on the city council, I knew that I wasn't going to run again. It just felt like that felt like the right amount of time for me. Um, for other people, maybe they'll serve longer, but it felt like that felt like the right amount of time. And so um, one of the things I did is I called a friend who was very involved in the community but hadn't really been involved in city government. And I said, I, I want you to run for my city council seat in two years. And um, I said, and I'm telling you now, so that you have some time to think about it and to um, get involved and do all those things. And so she did. And now she's actually in my old city council seat. She's, she's ran and won. And, um, but it was something that had never even occurred to her, but she is very much like me. But guess what, when she got there, they were ready for her, right? So sometimes I think it's, how do we tell the people coming behind us? You know, like we, we push where we can, but we, we um, help help the people coming behind us. And then also, how do we help the people that are already there? So um, I, I've been in some unfortunate situations sometimes because people don't, um, they haven't encountered women in these scenarios and sometimes they don't know how to deal with them. I had a experience a number of years ago where um, we were having an event with the governor, a legislator I had worked with was there. Um, and so I was trying to like, you know, it's crowded. So you're trying to get that person, the legislator, up to meet to talk to the governor. We get there, we get to talk to the governor, and the legislator says, um, "Oh, I just want you to know, Governor, how much I like working with Karen. I, I call her my work wife, which I had never heard him say, which is incredibly unprofessional, which implies something totally inappropriate, right? And I was shocked. And so I turned to him and I said, "Wow, you've just made things really uncomfortable for me." And so. And he didn't even think about it. He didn't even realize that that, you know, what he was saying. But I, I will guarantee he's never said anything like that again, right? So sometimes we just have to help people, um, not in a way that's super confrontational or just like, I hope you understand how that came across. Or I hope you know that, you know, people could have taken that this way um, and, and not in front of everyone. And I, I think that we help each other just by helping each other be more cognizant of how we act, how we behave. And, and, but we can do it in a way that doesn't alienate that person and it doesn't make you the enemy. It just makes you actually helping that person also be more successful. Um, and I think that's something we, we have to do. Wonderful, thank you, thank you. Um, we had another question in the chat from Steve. He asked, how do you make sure that rural areas have as much voice as urbanized areas, especially as urbanized areas are more likely to have opportunities to interact with mass media? I That's a great question. Um, so I love the Utah Rural Leadership Academy um, because it gives an opportunity for us to build leaders in rural Utah. And because your voices are really important, just like I talked about um, for me, how important local control is because rural communities are different. 
they um, they just have different opportunities and they have different challenges. And I don't want to impose Wasatch Front rules on rural community. It just it doesn't work. Um, and so I think it's really important that we help um, those rural voices be heard. Um, we have some incredible rural legislators serving right now. Carl Albrecht, if you know Carl, he is an incredible voice for rural Utah, and he makes sure we don't forget about you. You know, he will talk about what does this mean for rural Utah? With all of the bills I'm running this session, um, I have met with the Association of Counties or with some of our rural school district superintendents because I want to make sure if we're talking about it, it also makes sense in rural Utah. Um, so part of it is electing really good leaders and strong voices from your community. Um, and I think part of it as our um, our responsibility as a university is helping prepare people to be strong leaders uh, from rural communities. Um, and, but I, it is really important. I, I think too, I have a different perspective. Having come from the governor's office, I spent a lot of time all around the state and I got to hear from a lot of different communities. And I think that helps me personally. And then also in my professional job at Sunrise, most of our clients um, are small communities. There are small towns and communities. I'm working with those mayors and those city councils. And so I hear from them, um, but not everybody in the legislature has that opportunity to um, have that much exposure to rural Utah. And so um, it's something that I think is important. Who your leaders are and who you, you um, send up there from rural Utah to represent you is really important. Awesome, thank you. Um, I'll ask a question. Um, I'm curious, so with um, running campaigns and all that kind of stuff, what is like the biggest piece of advice you would give to someone who's potentially interested in running campaign, running a campaign in the future? Yeah, so um, I think the two things that have been helpful to me are first thinking about why me? Why am I running? What do I have to offer? And being able to articulate that in a really short and concise way. So um, I, I talked a little about when I ran for city council the first time. The first time I ran for city council, um, I had a lot of people say, you know, well, you're a mom, you've got little kids, can you do this? And one of the reasons I was running was I cared about um, our community and I wanted our community to be a place where my kids could grow up, right? And they could be safe here and they could have opportunities here. And so anytime someone would say that, I would say, well, I'm running because I have kids. I'm running because I want them to, you know, so whatever my things were, my 30 second things about the reason that I thought I should be, I always pivoted to those things, right? I always made sure I was really clear on why me. And I could explain that in a short amount of time. When I ran for the legislature, you know, I talked about I've lived in this community, I have represented this community, I know this community, and I wanna go represent us. Um, that was what was important to me, right? So understanding why you and being able to articulate it is important. And then second, just being willing to talk to everyone. Um, you know, a lot of elected officials can get in echo chambers and they only hear from certain people all the time. And so then they think they're representing their community because the only people they're hearing from agree with them. <laughs> and so the other important thing is just putting yourself in situations where you're hearing from everyone in your community and not just certain people in your community. Um, so I both, every time I run, I've knocked thousands of doors because I like to stand on people's porches and I say, hi, I'm Karen Peterson. I, you know, running for the city council or I'm running for the legislature. And I wanna know what the most important thing to you is. What are we doing well? What can we do better? And, um, and then just listening to people. I have learned so much doing that. Um, and I just really appreciate it. And sometimes, most of the time people are say, well, I don't know, you're putting me on the spot. I don't have something right then. And so then you can say, here, well, you've got my phone number now. You call me if you think of something, you know? Um, but I think those two things have made me a successful campaigner um, because I can articulate who I am, but I'm also willing to listen and learn and, and then, you know, help that inform uh, how I'm running. Awesome, thank you. So Dr. Carter and I uh, you know, have talked about our own career paths in, in that jungle gym type form. How, how do you help others to overcome that fear of, of the career as a jungle gym? Sometimes you have to make you know, leaps from uh, one monkey bar to another. <laughs> like it's, how, do you, how, you know, 
how do you help build someone to feel confident or comfortable working through that that jungle gym? Because it's not as clear cut as as the career ladder used to be. I think I think that's a question us old people ask. <laughs> I, I feel like um, the young people in my life are much more flexible <laughs> and much more willing to take risks and they have a different expectation. Um, and I think the pandemic has even borne that out even more of people um, having a different expectation uh, from their employers and from what they want out of their careers and how they want their uh, work-life balance to be. So it's probably us that still need to think about how do I jump from one place to another? I would also say, Having a good support structure is important. And then also, um, like, I, I sometimes have students reach out to me and say, will you be my mentor? And as much as I'm happy to be helpful, if I don't really know that person, if I don't really know their context, if I don't really know that I'm not really that helpful as their mentor. What's better is if they reach out to people that they have really good exposure with and then can bounce things off them, right? If they can have that structure around them to, to really bounce um, ideas off people, to talk about opportunities, are they the right opportunities? I mean, I haven't said yes to everything, right? Some things have come along over the years and they have not been, um, I haven't felt good about them, they haven't been the right fit. And, you know, while they might pay better or something, you think, where do I want to be in five years? And does this get me towards that or not, even if it pays better, you know? Um, making those kind of decisions for yourself about what your long-term goals are. Wonderful. I, 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 Joel, said, I didn't mean to call you old. Just saying oh, you're old. <laughs> it's funny because when you said uh, that, though, Roger or Dr. Carter looked at me and just shook his head. I was like, oh, that's so true. Like, well, I was a fan. <laughs> oh, he said he was a fan. Are you really that bad? Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. It, uh, it, it's true. I, I you know, you look at some of our younger students as well. And it, they are. They're a lot more flexible and that are probably a lot better than, you know, I would say I was at even when I was uh, younger in my career. And so, yeah, it, um, you know, when I look at the individuals in our in our program, a lot of them are, are seasoned career professionals. And so they're, they're working through that, that jungle gym right now. And um, I just appreciated the comments though, and having that support system in place, especially that, uh, you know, I, I think about my jump into academia. I know Professor Carter could say the same thing. If we didn't have our support system in place, there's no way we could have made that that jump. It's just, it just wasn't going to happen. So, I, yeah, I appreciate it. I think that was a wonderful comment. Um, we're quickly running out of our, our up against our, our one o'clock wall with our students. Um, uh, Representative Peterson, I just want to thank you so much for, for being here with us. Being just such a, a great model and example for for our students, um, you know, I, I don't know if everyone caught this, but she mentioned you know of as a transition from Governor Herbert's office to Governor Cox's office, only three pe people, right? So of an entire um, you know governor's staff, only three people were asked to remain on, and, and Karen was one of them. So I think that just says so much about uh, the type of person she is, uh, the way she you know carries herself and does the work, and it just. Grateful to have her as a member of our program and helping us uh, grow our MPA program. So thank you so much. Yes, and come say hi to me at MPA Day on the Hill or SCU Day on the Hill. I'd love to see y'all. I'm so glad you, so everyone, yes, on January 26th, please don't forget, we will be at the Capitol. Um, we'll make sure to, to drop by and say uh, hello to Representative Peterson and, and uh, some of our other legislators up there. So we're looking forward to that. So thank you. Okay, you're welcome. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Have a wonderful. Thanks, students. It was great having you all on.